Hello. It's wonderful to be here. The New South. It's a very large topic and one that has a number of different meanings or interpretations. Many colleges and universities divide Southern history into at least three semester-long courses, Old South, Civil War and Reconstruction, and the New South. In this configuration, the New South is Southern history since the end of Reconstruction to the present. Uh, but the term is also used to denote a shorter period in Southern history and a particular emphasis, the period during and following Reconstruction when an ideology of boosterism promoted economic progress through industrialization. The South would rise again, but it would do it by rejoining the mainstream of national endeavor and by out-yanking the Yankee through developing its natural resources, embracing industrialization, and with lesser emphasis, diversifying agriculture. It is this latter approach that we're using in this month's architreats. Chronologically, we will be exploring roughly the period from the end of Reconstruction into the early 20th century. Fortunately, we have two sessions to this theme. Today, we explore a social and economic view. Next month, Sam Webb will address the politics of the New South. And it is, of course, very hard to separate the social, the economic, and the political in Southern history. In Southern history, it is also difficult to separate myth and reality. Paul Gaston, a noted Southern historian, wrote a book analyzing the ideology of the New South and the men who promoted the concepts. His book is entitled, The New South Creed, A Study in Southern Myth-Making. There are two words in that title that are central to our discussion, creed and myth. Creed is a conscious statement of how things ought to be, and myth is an unconsciously held belief in how things actually are or were. We at Southerners are great at our myths. Out of the defeat of the war and the experiences of Reconstruction, white Southerners created the myth of the Old South, where everyone lived on a plantation with beautiful bells, brave and chivalrous gentlemen, surrounded by happy slaves. But the reality of Southern life after the war was poverty, devastation, and social upheaval, out of which grew another myth that the South would be restored to power and prestige by building a new social and economic order based on industry, diversified agriculture, and harmonious race relations. Both myths were expressions of hopes, values, and ideals, and they came to shape the way in which Southerners perceived reality. The New South Creed arose out of the condition and needs of the post-war South. The antebellum South revolved around three economic and social interests, staple crop agriculture, plantation aristocracy, and black slavery. In general, although there were exceptions, the system was hostile to the growing industrialization, urbanization, and culture of the rest of the nation. But the post-war South now had to find a new material basis, new social relationships, and a new intellectual rationale for Southern society. Out of this gradually arose the New South Creed. The most well-known spokesman and popularizer of this pathway of the New South was Atlanta newspaper man Henry Grady. In 1887, Grady was the speaker at the annual banquet of the New England Society of New York. For the keynote address, the society desired to have a respected Southerner and one who would speak of reconciliation. The audience was primarily composed of conservative businessmen who were interested in investing Northern money in the South if it was a suitable environment. Grady was a good choice. He did not even take offense at sharing the platform with General William Tecumseh Sherman while the band played Marching Through Georgia. Now, was Grady the only one who was aware of the irony of all of this? 
Grady began his speech with words spoken in 1886 by fellow Georgian Benjamin H. Hill. And I quote, There was a South of slavery and secession. That South is dead. There is a South of union and freedom. That South, thank God, is living, breathing, growing every hour. That opening and the rest of Grady's speech contain the essence of the New South Creed. Here's part of what he said. We have found that in the summing up, the free Negro counts more than he did as a slave. We have planted the schoolhouse on the hilltop and made it free to white and black. We have sowed towns and cities in the place of theories and put business above politics. We have challenged your spinners in Massachusetts and your iron makers in Pennsylvania. We have learned that the cash annually received from our cotton crop will make us rich when the supplies that make it are home raised. We have smoothed the path to southward, southward, wiped out the place where Mason and Dixon's line used to be and hung out our latch string to you and yours. The major tenets of the New South Creed can be derived from that summation. First, nationalism. De-emphasize regional differences that had set the South off from the rest of the nation. Emphasize reconciliation, nationalism, union, and brotherhood. The anticipated rewards included attracting northern capital, which would aid industrialization and bring prosperity. And it might foster a degree of self-determination in racial policy. In other words, the, the North would leave the South alone in these matters. Secondly, industrialization and diversified agriculture. Richard Hathaway Edmonds, founder of the leading periodical of the New South Movement, Manufacturer's Record, preached that wealth and power flowed from machines and factories. The abolition of slavery had loosed the chains that bound the region to agriculture. The South could share the prosperity of the North by diversifying agriculture and developing its natural resources through industrialization. But the South needed northern or English capital and perhaps immigration. Thirdly, the gospel of work and social Darwinism. To accomplish its goals, the New South would embrace prevalent national philosophies of social Darwinism and the gospel of work. Now, this is where the out Yankee, the Yankee, really comes in. It also meant that Southern leaders, who were mainly Redeemer Democrats by now, supported the economic philosophy of laissez-faire much in line with the controlling Republicans on the national level. But to go into that, I'm straying into next month's lecture. So I'll leave that in the Sam. Fourth, moderation in race relations. New Southers assured Northern leaders that the rights of African Americans would be protected. This did not mean a repudiation of white supremacy but an advocacy of moderation in race relations. Practical education would make productive, if second-class, citizens of blacks. It should be obvious that there would be opposition for the future uh, of such a plan in the South, and that would lead to social, political, and economic battles uh, throughout our history during that period. But now how did all of this, how did the creed play out in the deep south state of Alabama? All facets of the creed can be found and have provided rather rich ground for historians to explore, although there's still a lot of work to be done on this. Now where do we begin? My major emphasis is going to be on industrialization since this was the primary concern of those who tried to reconfigure a new south. But 90% of Alabamians were farmers or in farm-related endeavors. So let's begin with an overview of agriculture in postbellum Alabama. Cotton remained king. Most Alabama farmers rejected diversified agriculture. Whether white or black, they knew how to grow cotton. Technological advancements lagged behind in the South and illiteracy prevented farmers from reading literature, which might have helped them to change. By the 1880s, cotton production in the South 
had risen to pre-Civil War levels, but market prices dropped throughout the 80s and 90s. For instance, 1874 to 77, they were getting 11.1 .1 cents per pound. 1894 to 97, they were getting on an average 5.8 cents per pound. The patterns of farming had also undergone significant changes. Landowners had no cash to pay wages for laborers. <coughs> Freed people had no money to buy land. Struggling with the loss of livestock and farm equipment during the war, poor whites lacked access to credit or funds to pay taxes. For instance, every third mule and half of agricultural machinery was lost during the war. Sharecropping and tenant farming became the pattern uh, in Alabama and across the South, and it was for both blacks and whites. In 1880, the South had 300,000 tenant farms. In 1910, there were 1,300,000 tenant farms. And this didn't change until you get into the 1930s. Mechanization and New, New Deal policy would force some people off the land. Plantations were divided into parcels and worked by families instead of gangs of slaves. Tenant farmers rented land from the landowners. Sharecroppers had access to land in exchange for a share of the crop. Since banks were scarce, liens against the crop brought the farmer credit at a country store for groceries, seed, and fertilizer. Typically, the farmer would receive one-third of the crop, one-third went to the landowner, and the remaining third paid for whatever had to be bought on credit. Most sharecroppers were in perpetual debt or only managed to break even. The debtor was bound by law to stay and work off the debt. Yeoman white farmers were in much the same situation as croppers. As cotton prices fell, many of these drifted into tenancy or moved into the textile mills. The cropper was not the only victim in this system. One crop agriculture slowly exhausted the land. Antebellum landowners often lost their land and increasingly the landowner might be absentee. A landowner who'd moved to town, a merchant, a bank, or a northern firm that had bought the land. The country store owner or merchant serving as the substitute uh, banker is often portrayed as a villain, but he could find that the cropper had absconded, leaving behind his debt. Noting that the merchant had probably obtained his credit from an eastern financier, southern historian C. Van Woodward said, the merchant was only a bucket on an endless chain by which an agricultural region was drained of its wealth. The frustration of Alabama farmers grew as they faced falling prices, mounting debts, eroded land, exploited monopolies, illiterate children, and politicians who ignored them. Ultimately, many of them joined the Populist Party and participated in a remarkable third party movement. But again, that's a topic for next month. Although New South boosters spoke of diversified agriculture as part of the plan for the South's recovery, they did little to foster it. Their main concern was the development of the South's mineral resources and the establishment of industry. Alabama was not without industry in the antebellum period. Most was related in some way to agriculture, grist mills, timbering, sawmills, textile mills. The state's first textile mill was established around 1815 near Huntsville on the Flint River. The most important antebellum figures in textiles was a New Hampshire native, Daniel Pratt, who moved to Alabama in 1833. Setting up in Autauga County, Pratt manufactured cotton gins and opened a textile mill. An early supporter of Alabama industrialization, Pratt and other proponents of a more diversified economy faced a hostile environment. Thomas Jefferson's uh, philosophy of an agrarian society as the best life was one with which most Alabamians would have agreed. The vision of an agri uh, agrarian society would fit well in the rich soil of Alabama's Black Belt. But except in the river valleys, North Alabama's mountains, ridges, and poor soil 
could support only small farmers, not plantations. But underneath that infertile soil, potential wealth existed in the form of minerals and building materials, such as iron ore, limestone, dolomite, coal, and marble. In the 1850s, the report of state geologist Michael Toomey brought more attention to these mineral resources. The defeat of the Confederacy lent support to the arguments of those who were advocating industrialization. During the Civil War, early Alabama iron makers operated furnaces and uh, mines in aid of the Confederacy. And although Union troops destroyed many of these furnaces, Alabamians and outsiders had become increasingly aware of the mineral riches of Jefferson County. Though the thin soil of the hill country was not well suited for farming, the area had the remarkable confluence of the three major ingredients needed for an iron and steel industry, iron ore, coal, and limestone. After the war, eager entrepreneurs faced several obstacles. One was transportation. In a complicated tale of political maneuvering and financial chicanery, railroad promoters competed for state-endorsed railroad bonds that helped finance construction that opened the Mineral District of North Alabama to markets outside the South. In 1871, speculators of the Elaton Land Company laid out a new town in grids on top of an old cornfield. They named it Birmingham after the English Industrial Center. Alabama's dream of a new South that would challenge the industrial cities of the North began in a county that had been so poor that one earlier observer had said that a buzzard flying through needed to carry his own provisions. <laughs> Shortly after the first lots were sold, the dream was dealt a cruel blow when cholera epidemic struck the town in 1873. The economic depression of the same year almost emptied the town, but it survived. A more persistent obstacle to building an iron and steel industry was capital. As we have heard in the words of Henry Grady, Southerners courted northern capital and much of the money for Alabama's industrialization came from outside the region, including England. Men, as well as capital, came south. Some were Civil War veterans who had seen the potential of the region. Others were engineers and entrepreneurs. After the dismal 70s, the change from charcoal to coke as the fuel to produce pig iron overcame a major technological obstacle to competing in national markets. The change came through the work of Henry de Bartoladen, Truman Aldridge, and James Sloss who formed the Pratt Coal and Coke Company in 1878. Their first blast furnace began operation in 1880. Subsequently, the founding of other companies and the building of more furnaces brought the total to 53 furnaces operating in Alabama by 1891. As more capital flowed into the region, larger companies evolved from a host of smaller ill-financed ventures. A later chronicler uh, offered a very simplified summary of Birmingham's casual wheeling and dealing manner of doing business. He said, the mineral lands constantly changed hands with the speculators climbing in and out of bed with one another, incorporating today and reincorporating tomorrow. That's the easiest way to put it because it's a complicated business. In 1886, the largest merger of all brought the Tennessee Coal, Iron, and Railroad Company, commonly called TCI, into the Birmingham area where it became the dominant coal and iron concern in the district. TCI led the way in establishing the technology that allowed the economically feasible use of low-grade Red Mountain ore to make basic pig iron. Now, that's the type that's needed for the production of steel. In 1895, TCI began the production of basic pig iron for northern customers, and in 1898, launched construction 
of its own open heart steel facility at the Inslee plant. The Birmingham district had now become a true competitor in the nation's iron and steel industry. The success of this industry, launched by engineers, entrepreneurs, and financial schemers, depended on overcoming another obstacle. Where would the needed workers be found? With promises of a better life, labor agents rounded up thousands of able-bodied young men, black and white, from the depressed rural areas of Alabama and the surrounding states. Although Birmingham never had the influx of heavy European immigration that most northern cities did, the city did have a significant foreign population, which also resulted from direct recruitment by local industries. Um, the English, the Scots, the Welsh, the Germans blended in quickly into the native population. Italians, who often came as strike breakers in the 1880s and 90s, encountered more discrimination than, than the other groups, but they also gradually assimilated into the native population. The most significant and cohesive group among this diverse set of workers was African American. In 1870, blacks accounted for only 20% of the district's population. By 1890, the proportion had risen to 40% generally confined to unskilled positions they were also subject to a rigid Jim Crow environment. African Americans also made up the majority of a group of non-free laborers. Lacking jails and prisons in postbellum Alabama, the state solved that problem and brought in revenue by leasing convicts to the industrialists. The system was subject to great abuse. Free workers opposed convict lease as a weapon used to prevent or break strikes and argued that convicts filled jobs that should have been available to free men. But in one form or another, convict lease continued in Alabama until 1928. All of these workers brought heavy cultural baggage of rural or ethnic traditions, attitudes, religion and work habits that shaped the town as much as the Iron Barons did. And I wish we had time to go into that more. But Birmingham won the moniker of the magic city for its rapid growth. From a population of slightly over 12,000 in 1870, the city reached over 226,000 in 1910. Birmingham was a new South City in contrast to the older urban communities in the rest of the state. The economic panic of 1907 brought a major change to the iron and steel industry of Alabama when United States Steel purchased TCI. Although local newspapers and most New South boosters hailed this as bringing needed capital and stability to the industry, becoming a U.S. Steel subsidiary also meant that TCI lost control of decision-making and pricing. TCI Steel was now subjected to what was known as Pittsburgh Plus, a pricing device that prevented TCI from taking advantage of its lower production costs to sell its products at a lesser price than older northern mills. Historians debate the impact of U.S. Steel takeover on the development of Alabama industries. Some have likened it to a colonial economy with control by outsiders. U.S. Steel continued the anti-union policy already practiced by Alabama industrialists, but introduced the philosophy of welfare capitalism to lessen labor turnover and bring in more stable, family-oriented men to the workforce. As the new TCI president, George Gordon Crawford, a native Georgian, with a strong background in the technical side of steelmaking, he ordered improvements to company towns, the establishment of company schools, health services that included the families of employees, improved sanitation measures, and safety features in the workplace. Dr. Lloyd Nolan was brought in from the staff of General Gorgas in the Panama Canal to head a well-funded Department of Health that worked to rid the area of malaria and polluted water supplies, 
create effective systems for the disposal of human waste, and provide health care, whether it was for industrial accidents or childhood diseases. Crawford also hired Winifred Collins, stern-looking woman. She was trained in Chicago's settlement house environment to head a department of social science for TCI, and he gave her the money to create extensive community programs for workers' families and to oversee the school system, which was judged by outside sources to be far superior to the average Alabama school. Combine this with the best wages in the district, and TCI cut its labor turnover dramatically and prompted several other companies to follow similar measures. But workers still chafed under the inability to organize in unions, and unions protested the paternalism of such programs. Strikes were often violent affairs. In 1894, the United Mine Workers of Alabama had reacted to wage cuts with a four-month strike that witnessed gun battles between unionists and company deputies, such as these here. Ultimately, the governor sent in the state militia. The strike was broken. The events of 1894 set a pattern for future strikes. Industrial companies cooperated with each other to oppose unionization and used an arsenal of available weapons, special deputies, public opinion, imported strike breakers, eviction from company housing, racial divisions within the workforce, and the cooperation of the state government and the state militia to break the strikes. Another coal miner strike in 1908, shortly after the U.S. Steel takeover of TCI, resulted in an almost total disappearance of the United Mine Workers from Alabama, except for a brief revival during World War I. Not until the Great Depression and the New Deal legislation did workers gain the right to organize and bargain collectively. The Great Depression also marked an end to most programs provided by companies through welfare capitalism. Birmingham was not the only town created in Alabama during the New South era. The Magic City was ringed by industrial towns such as Inslee, Bessemer, and Fairfield, as well as scores of smaller communities. Anniston, founded by Samuel Noble and Daniel Tyler, became Alabama's fourth largest city by 1900. Industrialization also fostered growth in older cities. Huntsville, Montgomery, and Gadsden gained textile mills, and Mobile benefited from a deeper shipping channel. Although coal and iron mining and iron and steel industries were the catalyst for the major thrust of industrialization in Alabama, other facets of the economy grew as well, including pre-Civil War industries such as grist mills, saw mills, and flour mills. Alabama's timber industries, timber resources, attracted outside capital to supply the nation's increasing appetite for lumber. In 1870, the South supplied less than 10% of the nation's timber. By the turn of the century, the region was supplying approximately one-third. That figure rose to almost 50% by 1930. Alabama joined Louisiana, Mississippi, and Arkansas among the top producers of timber in the nation. Conservation and renewal of those resources did not come about until the Great Depression and the work of the CCC. Cotton manufacturing increased as large and small Alabama towns sprouted textile mills. As New England mills aged, investors saw advantages in moving spindles south to take advantage of a mild climate, proximity to the raw material, cheap, non-unionized labor, extensive water and steam power, and a sympathetic state government. Recruited from sharecropping and the hard scrabble forms of the hill counties, entire families, mostly white, came to work in the mills and live in company towns. Accustomed to the entire family working on the farm, parents seldom objected to the employment of their children in the mills. Mill owners often preferred children because they were paid lower wages and were more agile around the machinery. Although Alabama passed the pioneering child labor law in 1887, 
Pressure from industrialists brought repeal in 1894. Between 1890 and 1900, there was a 386% increase in children under 16 who were employed in Alabama mills. By 1900, children made up 25% of the state's total textile workforce. The photograph you see was done by noted photographer Lewis Hine, who was working for the National Child Labor Committee, and he documented, documented these children working at Avondale Mills of Braxton Bragg Comer in 1910. Related industries grew from a former waste product, cottonseed, as this became the raw material for oil, soap, fertilizer, and stock feed. Railroads were essential to Alabama's industrial growth. By 1872, Mobile was connected with Montgomery, Birmingham, and Nashville by rail lines. Another line linked Birmingham's Mineral District with Meridian, Mississippi, and Chattanooga. From 152 miles of track in 1852, the state's rail lines had grown to 4,000 by 1900. In a state blessed with rivers, the problem of the fall line as a barrier to transportation was gradually overcome with dams and locks. Lacking a major river, Birmingham gained easier access to the improved port in Mobile by a rail link connecting the mills to a port developed on the Warrior River system. Industrialization and urbanization brought more diversity to the state's economy, but it also created new problems and cries for reform. Led by Montgomery Minister Edgar Gardner Murphy, middle and upper class white women fought against child labor in the state. Others worked to end convict lease or to improve an impoverished school system. Understanding that they lacked leverage because they could not vote, some women moved into the campaign for woman suffrage. Realizing that the Alabama legislature would never pass a state amendment, are we surprised? Birmingham's Patty Ruffner Jacobs broke with many other Southern suffragists and worked for the passage of a national amendment. When the 19th Amendment went out from Congress for ratification by the states, Alabama was not among those voting to ratify. But a Southern state, Tennessee, put the amendment over the top in time for Alabama's women to register and vote in the 1920 presidential election. Although New South advocates included improved education in their platform, the state continued to lag behind. African Americans lost some of the gains made during Reconstruction. Attempting to support a dual segregated system, school boards favored white schools with the funding very unevenly divided. Higher education was also influenced by industrialization and urbanization. Southern University moved from Greensboro to Birmingham, becoming Birmingham Southern College. Howard College, now Samford University, left Marion in the Black Belt and moved to the Magic City in 1887. With land-grant status, the Agricultural and Mechanical College of Alabama, now Auburn University, reached out to farmers through extension work as well as training future engineers and opening its doors to women. The state established normal schools to train teachers, including Florence State Normal School and similar schools in Troy, Livingston, and Jacksonville. Julia Tutwiler, president of Livingston, became a major voice for educational reform. With a philosophy compatible with the New South Creed, Booker T. Washington, the major spokesman for his race in the late 19th century, founded Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute in 1881. He seemingly trusted in the goodwill of Southern white businessmen, emphasizing hard work, thrift, and economic progress over political progress. He believed that economic education and opportunity were the pathway for African Americans. Alabama reformers involved themselves in other areas of reform, including the temperance movement, and the regulation of utilities and railroads. We begin with a discussion of myths and creeds. 
When did the New South Creed move into the realm of myth? By the mid-1880s, New South spokesmen moved from promises and predictions of progress to triumphant pronouncements of New South success. But what of reality? In 1860, the South had 17.2% of U.S. manufacturing establishments. In 1904, the region had 15.3%. In 1860, the per capita income of the South was 49.7% of the national average. In 1900, it was 49.8%. Now, Alabama and the South had indeed made great strides, but the region stood in relationship to the rest of the nation in 1900 just about as it had in 1860 because the rest of the country wasn't standing still. But the myths of the Old South and the New South were entrenched and they were persistent. In the 1930s, Gone with the Wind, which is based on both myths, captivated not only Southerners but those outside the South as well. But the strongest challenge to the New South Creed in the 19th century came from an embittered poor farmers in the populist movement of the 1890s. But ultimately, they failed. The 1901 Alabama Constitution saw disfranchisement of not only blacks, but many poor whites. But again, I'm moving into next month's topic. But disappointing statistics and failed political movements do not always tell the whole story. The industrialization of this state provided alternative opportunities for many Alabamians that often led to a better life for them or their children. And I want to conclude the story of two families. In 1976, I sat in the modest living room of a home in Edgewater, Alabama, a former coal mining community of TCI. To my question, Herschel Craig, a retired coal miner, replied with a hearty laugh, why did I leave the farm? The boll weevils got me. So I came to Birmingham to work and that's where I ended up, in the mines. His wife, Era, joined in. He never did work anywhere before except down on the farm. Four more children joined that family in addition to the two that had been born on the farm. Arrow's recollections in that interview focused on the schools and the medical services that were made available to her family by the company. All of their children graduated from high school and one went to college. None became minors. Era proclaimed, we couldn't get the start from our daddy. We just could not get it if it hadn't been for TCI. Now, Herschel's memories centered around the camaraderie he'd had with his fellow coal miners. And although he shared Arrow's appreciation of what the, country had, or the company had provided to their children up until the Great Depression, he joined the UMW when the opportunity came, and he also appreciated what the union gave to him and other coal miners. Ike Maston is from a later generation. He mined ore, not coal, but his story is similar. When he was a child, his family moved from Dallas County to the ore mining town of Winona on Red Mountain. In the Great Depression, his father went to West Virginia in search of work, but later returned to Winona. Ike followed in his father's path and became an ore miner. Though the mines are now closed and sealed, Ike's knowledge of an industry and a lifestyle are contributing to the work of the Red Mountain Park and Greenways Commission as it preserves the history of the New South era through the establishment of what is going to become the largest urban park in the United States. The park, covering over 1,000 acres, acres from Homewood to Bessemer, stretches across the north and south slopes of a mountain dotted with such sealed mine entrances that lead to an underground honeycomb of tunnels that extend hundreds of feet below the surface. As remnants of industrial mines and buildings are recovered from kudzu and privet, park personnel are also conducting oral histories with former ore miners and their families. The park will bring to life not only the technical and the economic side of a New South industry, 
but also the cultural history of miners who raised families and lived and died in company towns that were then remote from the Magic City. Park Ranger Eric McFerrin captured the purpose of the park, and I quote, people are connected spiritually and emotionally to the mines. This property that was so important in their lives has been returned to them. It's not just the structures we're interested in documenting, it's also the story of the people. Though it might not be as romantic as the Old South or as stirring as the Civil War, the industrialization of Alabama in the New South shaped the state as it moved through the late 19th and into the 20th century. And it is important that we not only understand the period, but also seek to preserve the history of the people who lived and worked in these crucial decades of Alabama's history. Thank you. We now have, t have time for questions. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and we will give you a microphone to speak into and hold the microphone to your mouth. There are others in the second auditorium that would like to hear your questions also. Hey, thanks. I enjoyed that very much. Um, even though it's topic for next week, could you define what you mean by the gospel of work and social uh, Darwinism? Okay. Um, gospel of work. Did, did everybody hear the, the question? Gospel of work is um, most associated with a Baptist preacher named Russell Conwell who preached that anybody could succeed through hard work. And he made, I don't know how much money, preaching this. He recycled that sermon thousands of times. So, um, and he'd go around the country with this, this sermon, and it was called Acres of Diamonds. And he would um, indicate that if you were poor, it was God's punishment to you. And that no one should attempt to help the poor because that would be thwarting God's will. Um, so it, it's very it's, it's a very interesting um, kind of, of concept and an interesting interpretation of Christianity. Um, Laissez-faire is translated basically as hands off. That you should let entrepreneurs and industrialists do whatever they want to do with no regulation. Uh, free wheeling kind of thing. However, if you really examine the period, they didn't want regulation, but they did want certain other things given to them, like low interest loans, exemption from taxes, uh, bonds for building railroads. So it was not pure laissez-faire, although that's what they claimed that they wanted. But actually, they were getting a great deal of assistance. So those were, and those were prevalent throughout pretty much the 19th century in the industrialization of the United States. Those were prevalent national philosophies. You do have some challenges that begin to come in the late 19th century. There were certain economists and social reformers and ministers that were beginning to challenge that. But you don't really see those challenges come to any sort of real fruition until you get into the progressive era, era of the early 20th century. And that would have been something fascinating to go into was progressivism in Alabama. But there wasn't time. So. I enjoyed your lecture. Uh, even though there was an increase in, man in cotton manufacturing textile in 1880s and 1890s, what is the root cause of the decline of the cotton prices during that same era? Uh, new markets opening up worldwide contributed to a large extent. Areas in Canada, Australia, uh, India um, were, were part of the problem that it was no longer just the South that was producing this. And, so, and you also have several economic depressions during this, this time, not only 18... Uh, 73, but also 1893 and then 1907, uh, 
economically, the whole nation was on this kind of roller coaster ride during this, this period. And farmers all over the nation, regardless of what they were growing, were having problems. That's a wonderful overview. What's your um, your sense of a relationship, the ratio between the outside owned businesses and the domestically owned uh, corporations or large businesses in Alabama? That's a good question, Ed, and I want somebody to tackle that one at some time. Uh, I've always thought it would be very interesting to, for somebody to do a biographical study of all the industrialists in Alabama for a certain time period and find out where they came from. And so far, I haven't persuaded anybody to do it, and I haven't gotten the energy to do it. But a lot of the capital for developing uh, Alabama industry came from northern capitalization, people who were coming in, or southerners who were going and getting that capitalization. And a lot of it came to England. If you look at a lot of the, the leading industrialists in Birmingham, you find an English background there. I don't know the ratio. But I think that would be, if anybody's looking for a master's topic or a dissertation, I think that would be uh, a really interesting one, is to take Birmingham itself, or the, the Birmingham district, and study all the people who were involved and see where were they getting their capital. Leah might have, do you have some insight into that? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, yes, uh, I was interested in how Alabama, compared to other states like Georgia and Mississippi uh, during this period. Well, I haven't studied Georgia and Mississippi, uh, but Birmingham became the leading uh, coal, iron, and steel area of the South. And it appears to me that in terms of at least that part of the industry, there's, they're much more significant than some, uh, some other areas. TCI actually got its beginning in the Cumberland Mountains of Tennessee, but it moved its headquarters to Alabama because that was, that was the, the coming area. Um, the textile mills followed the fall line. So you find the textile mills throughout the South wherever the fall line was. And you can literally just track those textile mills coming down that fall line. And they, they tend to move inland because the fall line moves in, inland as you come through Virginia and the Carolinas and into Georgia and then Alabama. Uh, you mentioned England a couple of times during your lecture. Uh, can you tell us how much they, they affected the South, because I know they were affected as greatly during the Civil War and any by any Bellum period. But what about post Bellum? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first part of your question. Sorry, you talked about England a couple England. of times, okay. yes, ma'am. Can you tell us how much they affected the South during the Annie Bellum period? Well, the Annie Bellum period is not my period. You should have come to the earlier post, I meant post Bellum. <laughs> I meant post Bellum. Sorry. But I'm, the post Bellum, um, and I would say that Great Britain affected at least Alabama, significantly. A lot of those miners had Welch and Scottish backgrounds because they were coming out of the lead, the tin mines of those areas. Um, and so in some of the, the pictures that I have found of early industrialization, uh, it's not baseball that they're playing. It's, it's soccer and uh, rugby that this is what they're, they're playing. So your workforce has an influence there as well as the capital that was coming in had an influence. And the technology. Uh, they were getting some of the technology from like the Bessemer process for, for making iron or uh, uh, pig iron. That originated in, in England. Uh, and some of the other developments. They were getting that influence of that earlier industrial revolution in England definitely had an, had an impact. So it was, it was on a variety of levels that you get that impact. What about, like, I guess, internationally, whatever else you were sitting out? Okay, his question is, internationally, how did it have a, uh, an effect on what we were sending out? We were, we were still exporting some cotton to England, but more and more it could be used internally, domestically. And so many of those mills that had started in areas like Massachusetts 
were moving south because it was cheaper as those mills in the northern part of the United States age, rather than rebuilding the mill or replacing the machinery there, they would come south and build a mill. And so increasingly there was a domestic market for that and not as dependent upon selling it to outside to England. 